Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we'll continue with the uh, second talk for this morning. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Pierre Gentin for this talk. Uh, Pierre is an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Engineering uh, at the uh, Columbia University. He is an investigator in the Columbia Water Center and a director of the graduate program in the Earth and Environmental Engineering uh, department. Dr. Gentin investigates the continental hydrological cycle through land atmosphere interactions, boundary layer turbulence, convection, eco-hydrology, and remote sensing. He uses multi-scale modeling and machine learning for these investigations, and today he will show us some ways to incorporate physical constraints and domain knowledge into machine learning models in the earth sciences. Thank you very much, Pierre, for joining us today, and over to you. Thank you. Uh, just one second, because I, I noticed that I still have uh, uh, Firefox in the background. So one second, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Uh, just two. Okay, much better. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I, I had your voice twice with a delay, so that was disturbing. So thanks for having me. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to speak today. Uh, so I wanted to present uh, mostly, it's been mostly my thinking, I would say. So I got really excited about machine learning for some time and then I, I got disappointed in some ways and I'll try to share a little bit where I'm kind of at right now and, and yeah, where I feel that there's maybe so, some way forward. At least that's the thing I, I had these days. Um, that's joint work with uh, Meg Pritchard at UC Irvine. So Meg talked uh, the, uh, yesterday and Tim Berkler is a postdoc or research scientist now at UC Irvine in Columbia. Yu Cheng, a former student of mine, now at Harvard. Uh, Stefan Rasp in Munich and then Wendy Zhao, a visiting student from Peking University. And a lot of that will be about how can we merge basically between physics and machine learning. And I think a lot of us are actually trained in physics, you know, and we want our, 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 our earth system sciences and we want to know how we can actually use those tools to actually get intuition. And a lot of what I'll be discussing today is not using machine learning as a diagnostic, so not really trying that for say unsupervised learning, but trying to get a sense as to how we can use those tools to actually improve our physical intuition and, and improve basically the predictive power or the prognostic equations that we have at play. Okay, so uh, I'll just give you some very broad overview of some of my interests and why I thought that machine learning could be a useful tool for that. So the first thing that we want to know typically, especially in climate science, is by how much basically the planet will warm, you know, and that's basically a key question. And that's what we call climate sensitivity. And that's basically the response of the mean global temperature to some greenhouse gases, so mostly CO2 and methane and some other smaller greenhouse gases, but the main point is you want to know by how much the temperature would warm based on some emissions and, and there are some concentration of greenhouse gases in the air. And the trouble that we have is that there's extreme spread across different climate models. So the projection, as we call them, so the prediction in the long run that we have for those models is very disturbing and very, very much uh, uncertain. And just to give you a sense of those, this is a, a nice summary uh, paper from Tavio Schneider looking at when will we reach the Paris Agreement of a two degree warming compared to pre-industrial uh, uh, world? And what we see is that basically every dot here, our circle is, is a model, and that's basically the projection that you would get from different models. And what are the corresponding CO2 concentrations that you would have in the air for, to reach those two degrees? And what you can see here is that there's actually very, very substantial spread you know, between those different models. So, some models are saying we're going to reach that very soon, like 450 ppm is actually almost tomorrow. We are at 400 ppm if you're not aware of that. And some of them are saying it's 600, so we have some wiggle room here, right? And in fact, when you look at that, you can directly relate that to that quantity that we call the equilibrium climate sensitive, so sensitivity, which is basically the response of the planet once you reach a new equilibrium for a doubling of CO2. And in fact, at the end of the day, you can actually relate that back to very small things, you know, to clouds, basically. And because clouds are actually very important for the, the, the energy balance of the planet. And when clouds are actually becoming brighter, which is what's happening here on the right-hand side, 
it means that you have a little bit more time to actually to actually emit, you know, because they will actually buy you time, they will actually reflect more energy back to space, so that's actually beneficial. If clouds now get darker, which is this ampl amplifying feedback, then that's kind of bad news because it means that very soon we'd actually be reaching the, 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 those two degrees, you know, so that's kind of uh, the, the bad side of the story. And again, we don't know what is the truth here. So, I mean, we have some hypotheses as to which model is better, but, you know, so quite a bit of room. And it's not just a global problem. So a lot of times we're very interested in having a regional impact. We want to know, okay, will it be warmer? Will I have more precipitation, more droughts at that particular location? So say here in New York City or in California for fires, you know. But if you look, I mean, we have even more problems there because here is a very simple experiment where what those groups did is they, they basically bump some temperature where you have only the ocean here. So that's what we call an aquaplanet. So you just bump the temperature of the aquaplanet by four degree Kelvin. And you say, what is the response of just the atmosphere? So there's no land, just the ocean is prescribed. And we want to know by what will be the, the impact on the planet. And what you're seeing here is that the climate is actually very uncertain. So we have very different response depending on the type of model we use. And so if you just focus here at the bottom, uh, on the bottom row, which is precipitation, you will see that for the Max Planck model, for instance, you will see a lot of uh, moistening here. So a lot of precipitation in the tropics and a lot of drying in the subtropics. And the MyRock model here is doing just the opposite, you know? And so, and typically the strategy we use is actually we use some awesome average. So that's kind of bad news because maybe only one of them is the truth. And by taking the average, we are actually missing the point. So, that's actually very uncertain. And that's a major, major issue we need to solve. And that's not just for climate itself. So there's this very important piece of work on carbon climate feedback. And um, I mean, some of the earlier work by Pierre Friedenstein was showing that this is also extremely uncertain to some extent. And so if you look, uh, this is basically the cumulative uptake of CO2 from the ocean and the land as predicted by, again, some earth system models. And what you see is that there's actually very substantial spread in the, across different models as we move to 2100. And you could say maybe that's less important for climate, but it's not because that's actually what's defining the amount of CO2 that would remain in the atmosphere. And what we believe now is that there's roughly one third of the emissions that be, being picked up by the ocean, another third that's being picked up by the land, and the remaining of that basically stays up in the air, you know, and that's really what's creating global warming. So what we'd like to know is, how much of that is actually the truth. And, and the, 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 the bad side of the story here is the annoying fact is that some models are predicting that we will have a major carbon source from some ecos from ecosystem or terrestrial ecosystems. And some are saying that's gonna be a major sink. And I mean, we wanna know what will be the truth. And again, that spread is just too uncertain. I mean, we need to get uh, and, and get those processes better. And here, when we look at that, I mean, a lot of those are actually related to small scale processes and they are physical or biological processes that are controlling in that case, the carbon fluxes, you know, but a lot of that is basically how in your model are you doing the business of representing small scale processes that are actually major players at even the global scale. So we need to get and do a good job. So that's where we need to have better predictive models basically there. So you could argue that, you know, these days we have plenty of data and why don't we actually use the data we have as a way to actually infer those things and maybe improve the models we have, especially those earth system models. And we could target specific components where we feel we have sufficient data to actually target those. And one way to get around that is to say, I mean, what do those models do? And in fact, what they do is they parameterize as we call that. So they are trying to represent physical processes that we cannot resolve like clouds, for instance, because they are too small to be actually resolved at the scale of the, the Earth system model, which is roughly 100 kilometers or so. And what you want to know is you want to say, what's the mean behavior, the mean response that we're getting from those small scale processes? So that's the whole business of a parameterization. And that's happening in the land surface, for the ocean and for the atmosphere, for sea ice and all sorts of processes that we have. And just to give you an example here, what we have is that, for instance, you want to look at the impact of clouds and you would say, okay, I want to know whether clouds will be moistening or heating up the atmosphere. And you, the only thing that you know is actually just the, the core scale value, right? You only know the mean temperature or the mean humidity 
at that 100 kilometer grid size, right? You don't know the small details of like temperature and humidity, and you don't have the computational power to actually resolve them. And sometimes you don't even know the processes in the back. Okay. Now, the annoying thing is that uh, this type of strategy has pretty much failed for the last 40 years. So there's a very nice review paper by Dave Randall in 2003 showing that you know, this type of strategy is still struggling to a large extent. And so we don't still really know how to best represent clouds and we don't really know how to represent many like small biological surface processes. And that to a large extent, extent explains the intermodal uh, to the EL spread uh, between in, in terms of climate projection. So we need to be doing a better job there. So what are the challenges that we have is that, I mean, we really have to actually uh, try to represent many, many scales, you know, like from millimeter, you could even say smaller scale than that, like for especially for like microphysics for clouds, for instance, to 10 to the power of four kilometer, which is the entire Earth, right? And so that's a major numerical challenge for a long time coming. And even if we have high resolution simulations, that's still not sufficient. I mean, we can only run them over like some small domain, typically a small period of time. And the question is, how can we maybe leverage the, the tools that we have in terms of machine learning and the fact that we do have plenty of data these days from either high resolution models or from satellite observations. And maybe on the way, what we hope, especially as physicists or biologists, we'd like to learn some, something on the way, you know, because there are still many processes that we don't really understand right now. So one strategy would be kind of to leap across scales, right? You could say, okay, I can, especially if you think of the atmosphere, I kind of know the underlying equations, right? Those are Navier-Stokes. Uh, and what I could do is I could actually run a direct numerical simulation, so relatively fine scale model, uh, which is from millimeter to a few meter scale for like a few minutes or hours. And I could use that to actually inform a slightly bigger scale model, which is what we call a large edge simulation. And that large edge simulation actually cannot resolve all scales, and it has to represent through a parameterization the smaller scale turbulence, like sub meter scale. So that's what we call a separate scale model, this SGS model on the left hand side. Here. And you can go all the way to the top, and you can say, I can also pass that large edge simulation information maybe to a cloud resolving model. Um, and then you can go all the way to the top where you will have your Earth system model and you've learned multiple things on the way and hopefully you've basically leaped across scale. I mean, that's kind of the, the idea of that. And at the end, what the hope will be is to have basically or trying to parameterize things better at this very core scale resolution so that you don't really need to resolve every single uh, nitty gritty details of say turbulence or microphysics or, 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 or convection to clouds and how they are being represented. And again, just based on the means of value. So I'll try to show you two examples where we kind of felt at first that those things were working well. And so I will argue a little bit maybe against that later. And so those two examples will be looking at convection, so deep clouds. And in that case, we'll basically go on the right-hand side of that spectrum of scale. We'll say, can we use global, global cloud resolving models as a way to inform a general circulation model? And then we go to the left hand side here. We say, can we use a direct numerical simulation as a way to inform a large simulation? And basically trying to learn turbulence. So for deep clouds, so what the strategy we'll have is to say, let's use some global cloud resolving model, which is what we have here. And what we do is we cost drain the data. So the data, if you want, is roughly at a one kilometer scale. And the advantage that we have here is that we are pretty much resolving what we call convection, right? We are resolving deep clouds. We are resolving like a lot of organization of, 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 uh, of precipitation and, and, and clouds. And we believe that's something very important, you know, especially for the hydrological cycle. And so what you can do is you can take that data, even though you can only run that for some period of time, but you can use those short periods of time as a way to inform the development of a model. And you can say, I can, take that fine scale data at one kilometer, cause drain that to a scale that's similar to a, a, a climate model, so roughly 100 kilometer, which is this cause draining step here. And then at that cause drain resolution, I can actually learn what is the impact of those clouds, right? So based on some initial data that I have only available at the cause scale, I will have some mean temperature, some mean specific humidity, uh, some fluxes at the bottom, sensible and latent heat flux, so evaporation and some surface pressure, and I can pass that through some machine learning algorithm 
and I can predict basically the heating that's due to the clouds, the moistening that's due to the cloud, but also some other things like precipitation or the radiation at the top of the atmosphere. And here, what we used for the misfit was just a very simple mean square error. We are trying to target things that are slightly more subtle now. Uh, one of the issues is that precipitation has lots of zeros, and sometimes you do have it's very fat tail, so you need to be a bit more clever in the way you actually handle precipitation. But basically, you can pass that through a deep neural network using supervised learning, which you've learned about before. And then you can try and see whether that can replicate the behavior of the fine scale model. And when you do that, it actually works quite well. So those are actually uh, on the right, on the left column, you can see precipitation. Right hand side is radiation at the top of the atmosphere, outgoing long wave radiation. And when you compare basically the coarse grain cloud resolving model, again at that coarse resolution, to the machine learning algorithm, which is in the middle here, you can see that there's actually very good agreement between the two. And so we can really nicely capture a lot of the, 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 the strengths of convection in, in various places. And the misfit is actually quite pretty much like noise. Uh, you can see that there's a slight structure. So there's some degree of stochasticity, if you will. So the, that noise is actually not independent of the state. It's actually dependent on the state. So that's something that could be of interest to people. But that's basically doing a fairly good job, you could argue, and kind of the same goes for radiation as well. The advantage is that this machine learning algorithm is actually even cheaper than the original cost model. And it's actually much, much cheaper than the, the most expensive model, this uh, 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 cloud resolving like model. Now, one issue is really, I mean, that's working well to actually reproduce data. So in that case, we basically used the input data that we had from the cost scaled uh, um, super uh, uh, cloud resolving model. And at every time step, we were trying to predict what was happening at the next time step. You know? So that seemed to work well in that offline version. But we'd like to know if that's actually working, if you're actually taking that type of parameterization, as we call it, and plug that back into the model in replacement for, of a traditional uh, of behavior. And the other question is, will that actually generalize well? Because we are using historical data kind of here, but will that do a good job when you want to go to a much warmer climate? You know, that's a very important question. Otherwise, you're completely failing with the, the, that strategy. So we did try this online version where um, I, I, it's like, not like online learning, so I just want to be careful here. It's like we, we basically took that neural network parameterization plug that into the, into, the, into the climate model in a replacement for a traditional physically based parameterization. And then we compare it to the, to the result. And then you can look just at statistics because there's a divergence between the two fields where it's a chaotic field, so you don't expect them to match, but you can start looking at statistics like precipitation distribution, for instance. And what we found is that the neural network is actually very, very close to the, to the trained data in terms of the, even when it's living its whole life. Uh, and the advantage is you're getting some pretty decent extremes. I mean, the precipitation extremes are there uh, and they were basically absent, virtually absent in the original version, the physically based approach, which also had that model also had the issue of drizzling too much. So that's a very, very typical problem we see in climate models where they tend to drizzle or, or they, have, they have a lot more frequent precipitation and that precipitation is too weak. You know? So that's something that's a major issue to drive, say, the lens surface and the hydrology itself. Uh, it's not just about pure statistics and means. I mean, you can start looking at some modes of variability, like for instance, Kelvin waves or the Melanchian oscillation. Those are typical modes of climate variability we like to, to target and, and, and see whether we are doing a good job at reproducing. And then you can compare. So on the left-hand side here, you have the cloud resolving model, uh, which has a pretty decent MGO. You have some Kelvin waves here and some Kelvin waves, wave spectrum. And then that's the old version, so the, or the old, the typical, more physically based parameterization here, which has an exaggerated uh, uh, Kelvin wave spectrum and, uh, and has a very muted MGO. I mean, you can tune that to get a slightly better MGO, but it's, you know, you get into the business of tuning. When you compare, you know that, again, that completely uh, online version of the neural network uh, that's actually within the, the atmospheric model itself, I mean, it reproduces pretty well, you know, those characteristics and it can even reproduce a relatively decent uh, worker circulation as well. So we can capture modes of variability that are important, not just like targeting the mean state of climate. We can actually start looking at interesting features of the climate system. 
So we were pretty happy, uh, to say, when we got those results. Oh, actually, super happy. I wanted to show you another example, which is um, basically to look at turbulence. Uh, and the idea is to say we can run basically turbulent resolving simulations, and that's what we call a direct numerical simulation, DNS. And what we could do is we could do and use the same strategy in which we are cause graining the field and then using that field to actually basically learn what should be the representation of small scale turbulence in what we call a larger dissimulation, which is resolving cost of scale turbulence and, and the larger one, which oftentimes is more important. Uh, the, the challenge that people have had, you know, for to develop those parameterizations and those separate scale models is that they actually very strongly depend on buoyancy and shear. And it's quite unclear how we can actually approach that. So we know that there's, it does look like an eddy viscosity of some sort of eddy diffusion model. So it looks like a diffusion, you could say. But, but the issue becomes that you don't really know how that diffusion is actually being impacted by buoyancy and shear. And most of the, 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 the solutions have been pretty empirical. So what we did is we cost rain the field. We use a, a stencil of various sizes. So in that case, it's like a, some sort of 3D filter of size three by three by three. We tested that till like seven by seven by seven, but that basically did almost the same job. And the advantage is it, it's much easier to actually uh, uh, um, to parallelize when you have a smaller stencil. And then what we had is as an input of the neural network, we had the mean field. So uh, the, the, the mean field of velocity, so U, V, and W, three components of wind, temperature as well. And we used one trick, which was to actually also include the, the scale at which we were actually doing the cause graining, because what we wanted to add is we wanted to have a, some sort of uh, scale aware harmonization. So that was a way to actually define that scale awareness, and so that you would directly involve that length scale of the cause graining, which can be important, you know, because children could change as a function of scale. And then we fitted that into a deep neural network, used supervised learning, again, it's based on uh, a mean square error compared to the field. And we were trying to reproduce the Reynolds stress, which is kind of shear, and the heat flux, so the temperature flux uh, across there. So, and that's uh, in 3D, basically, in X, Y, and Z component. And just to show you some quick results, so uh, this type of approach seems to be doing a good job. So that's the original field on the left-hand side, so some cross-section within the boundary layer. Um, if you work on turbulence, everything is non-dimensional, so z equals 1 is some reference that we're using, doesn't really matter. Uh, but that's the original field, and when you compare that to a typical, uh, what we call Smagorinsky model, a typical eddy viscosity model, you can see that the correlation and the, the patterns are actually quite wrong, you know, and so there's not really much that you're actually getting from those models, and the correlation is only 0.2. And when you use the strategy that we had, when you have this 3D filter here within this deep neural network, I mean, you're getting to much higher results and you can see that you're much closer to the original field. And that tends to work as well when it's actually coupled online. So that's something we, we, we tested recently. So that works well as well. That's improving quite substantially. And the correlation goes to 0.9. So we can really capture a lot of the features that we have in turbulence. And the normalized RMSC also drops pretty systematically. So we are pretty happy with that. And, Still, it's not that complex as a neural network. Uh, and again, it goes just beyond the mean. I mean, you could say those are maybe snapshots, but a good way to check is to start looking at the spectrum. And it's actually important to get those right because that's also defining a lot of the dissipation of the subgrid scale. So you want to get that correctly as well. And you could say maybe the subgrid scale will have some importance or an impact on the large scale. And that's basically what we are finding is that when you look at the core scale direct numerical simulation, which is here in black, we're actually doing a very good job at reproducing those features in the, in the neural network version. So, uh, so we get a very good spectrum, which is nice at the larger scale. So this is in wave number here. So you can think of that it's the inverse of the length scale. So the smaller eddies are on the right hand side, larger eddies are on the left. And across scales, basically, we are capturing most of the modes and energy and variability. The typical Smagorinsky model is doing a poor job here, and the, the much better version, the Smagorinsky Bardino model, which is pretty much state of the art in terms of the viscosity model, is still not capturing a lot of the features we have here. It's doing a better job than the Smagorinsky model, but not to the extent of the, of the neural network. So we're pretty happy with that, and that's for the Reynolds stress, so stress, but the same applies to heat flux. And we thought, you know, it's Kind of nice, we're capturing some of the main modes of uh, variability in turbulence, and that's something at the spectrum is a good way to capture that and test that. So we're pretty satisfied with it. 
So, but on the way we started to be, or at least I started to be quite disappointed in many ways. And one of the issues that we have, and Mike alluded to that the other day is that we only have, we don't really have some energy and mass conservation in those algorithms, you know? So when you start about using those as a prognostic tool, I mean, you're basically missing mass or you're adding mass or you're missing or adding energy. And that's basically a no-no for many of the applications we have in mind. And, <clears throat> and then Mike actually showed you that as well, but the main point is that we can kind of learn that there's a mass conserv or energy conservation, which is here. So the neural network can, for the convection case, can learn that there's an energy conservation in the vertical. But it's only approximate, right? And you can have pretty substantial deviation at a very local, uh, in some very local instances. You know? So that's basically a major issue that we have here. A second issue that we have is one of generalization. And I'll show you just two quick examples. So if we go back to the example of turbulence, we played that trick where we said, can we learn things based on just the shear case, which is what a typical ch channel flow where you have a lot of shear, and try to use that to predict a much more buoyancy-driven case, so this really banal type of convection, which is on the right-hand side. And when we did so, and we did a converse experiment, learn on a really banal type of experiment and try to predict channel flow. And Basically, in every single case, we failed miserably. And we were much closer to a regular Smagorinsky type of result. So we were completely unable to actually uh, ex explain uh, uh, some other turbulent type of uh, behavior. And you could relate that back to some physical understanding. I mean, we know that the coherent structures that are transporting in a shear driven case are very different from the buoyancy driven case. In a buoyancy driven case, we have very strong updrafts and downdrafts, which is not the case uh, when you have streaks and, and, and and, 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 and uh, uh, roll vortices in, in shear driven cases. So we know that the flow and the transport is very different in those two cases. But when you start using those two, so you can use the most extreme cases to so the pure channel flow and almost a pure buoyancy driven case. And when you use those two, you can actually reproduce any type of things in between. So it's really telling you that, you know, those algorithms work really well for some interpolation problems, but they, they are really struggling every time there's extrapolation or some sort of generalization, or you need to find some tricks to actually get around that. And we had very similar issue when we started looking at convection as well. So you could say, let me try to make the game where basically imagine I can only fit my convection algorithm on historical data because I only have access to historical data. And let me try to predict what will happen in the future. So that's what we did in that case. So what the high resolution will be predicting here, so that's the heating rate um, as a function of time, or in that case, as a function of sea surface temperature warming. So as you start warming the sea surface temperature by one degree, two degree, three to four degree Kelvin, you can see the nice expansion of the high cell and contraction close, to the, close to, the, uh, to the equator, which is what you would expect. And when you use the model that's actually trained, so that's the neural network model here that's trained on the historical data, so at zero degree Kelvin, you can actually do a very, very poor job at extrapolating. And the trouble becomes that you're seeing the very, very typical issue that most physical parameterizations have. I mean, they have this double ITCC or intertropical convergent zone, which is very uh, uh, typical issue that most physical parameterizations have. And so, it's kind of telling us again that, I mean, those strategies actually don't work so, so well every time there's extrapolation. So that's a major roadblock to some extent. And you could play the game. Is it again a, a, an extrapolation issue or could it be something else? But when you play the game where you actually learn based on a zero Kelvin uh, climate and a plus 4K Kelvin climate, so half half, and you want to predict things in between, then it works actually quite well. So, Again, it's telling you that you know, those algorithms are really struggling every time they, they haven't seen things. And every time you're actually trying to explore kind of the, the, the tails or the, the, the things that you haven't seen in the original distribution. So that sampling of the distribution is going to be an issue. I would just have a quick detour here in terms of um, lens surface. So going back to the issue of carbon fluxes and, and the lens surface and what we've what a lot of people have been doing, and that's been basically been some really nice work and groundbreaking from a group at Max Planck in Vienna. What they've been doing is you can use data that's actually in situ data that are relatively sparse across the globe, but that span now a couple of uh, sometimes decades of, of, of data. 
And those are measuring basically the carbon, water, and energy fluxes uh, across the globe. But the trouble is that they cannot really give you a, 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 a time varying map, you know, which is something that you would want to actually constrain surface processes in your Earth system model. So what those people have done is basically they take uh, uh, things that we have at the global scale, so like weather data, uh, temperature, moisture, radiation, satellite data, especially of greenness, so some indicator of, you know, like kind of vegetation activity, plug that into some machine learning algorithm, like a neural network or random forest or regression tree, whatever. And then you're trying to predict the surface fluxes. So that's something that's called FluxNet MTE. The new version is called FluxCom. So that's been really groundbreaking in many ways because we can define global maps of, of, of carbon, water, and energy fluxes. And that seems to work relatively well. And when you look at the quality of those algorithms, so they tend to actually work quite well. So that's here, photosynthesis at the top, respiration here, the slightly lower, sensibility flux here, H, and latent heat flux with evapotranspiration here at the bottom. And you can see that across sites and time, I mean, they do a very decent job at capturing a lot of the variability we have. In fact, a lot of that you can see is you're capturing the spatial information very well. So that's what this across site is actually capturing. The mean value uh, across site is actually being captured very, very well by those algorithms. So you can nicely sample across space. The seasonal cycle is also very well captured by those algorithms. So that's quite good. You know, so you can have a very decent uh, seasonal cycle. You can start thinking about technology, what's controlling technology at the global scale. But when you start looking at anomalies like extremes, uh, those algorithms are pretty much failing. I mean, there's very little skill here uh, when you start looking at photosynthesis and, and evapotranspiration. So again, it's pointing to the fact that those algorithms are really struggling to look at extremes and oftentimes because they haven't seen that before. You know, so maybe you haven't seen as many extremes that you'd like and by definition, extremes are rare. So that's not the bulk of your feeding, right? And the feeding of your distribution. And that's kind of a bummer because when you start thinking of land surface flux, uh, fluxes and especially carbon fluxes, we know that extremes are actually very important. They are actually defining most of the modes of internal variability that we have in the carbon fluxes and the carbon uptake of the land surface. So, and that's in some nice work by Jakob Scheichler looking at basically how many extremes do you need to look at the internal variability. And basically they found that you just need very, very few extremes across the planet to actually explain most of the internal variability carbon uptake, and that's also related to the interannual variability in CO2 uh, from, from year to year on top of the emissions. So that's an issue. And so basically, a quick summary of the issues I, I, I mean, I particularly dislike, let's say, with brute force machine learning is that, first of all, they don't respect physical laws. And so, and oftentimes what we need in physics is we need to have very strict conservation laws, right, like energy and mass. And you could say I could penalize for that. I could add some Lagrange multiplier, you know, in my loss function, but that doesn't really help because it won't really be a strict requirement, right? So that's going to be an issue. And Mike actually alluded to that as well. Um, and then the other thing that you have is that, you know, those algorithms tend to work very well when they are within the range of the prediction. And by that, what I mean is really when the distribution you're actually looking at is actually the same as the original sample uh, distribution used for training. But as soon as you're outside of that sample, I mean, you really don't know what they are doing, you know, and that's, you're basically in the dark there. And that's a major, major issue. And that's especially an issue for us because we want to look especially at extremes or things that are interesting, like climate or at least like climate change. So my thinking these days have been kind of evolving along that, that, that map, you know, where you can think of that, you, you do have, I mean, you have this arrow here that's pointing out to how much data do you have, you know, what is your data kind of richness, you could say. And at the bottom, you could say that this green arrow is kind of pointing to the kind of your dominant knowledge, you know, how much you know about the, 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 knowledge, the, the, the field. You know? So for some things we know quite a lot, you know, like for instance, you know, uh, Navistox quite well, right? But you don't really know every single microbe, you know, that's actually regulating the carbon cycle. So it really depends on where you lie there. And you could say that the type of strategy you will use will actually be, be very dependent on where you actually sit in that, uh, in those different buckets, you know, and of course, I mean, it's more of, of a continuum, you know, it's not really uh, uh, as binary as I have here. You know? But the main point is that when you're on, on the left hand side, what this means is that you're basically in a data rich mode and by data rich here, I want to be 
very carefully by saying that it's not because you have a lot of data that you're data rich. You're data rich because you're actually sampling nicely your distribution. And basically when you want to test that on something else, your distribution is not changing it. You've sampled that very well in your original training data. So that's actually very important. In that case, the pure data-driven algorithms like the ones you've seen before, I think works very well, like a convolutional approach or GANs or, or a lot of those things, tools work amazingly well and they are very difficult to beat basically there. And most physical models may not work as well. But oftentimes what we have, I feel, is that we are more like in this center field here where we feel that we have a lot of data. We have a ton of satellite data. We have a ton of high resolution simulations we can run. Uh, but the trouble is that oftentimes we're not exploring everything. We are not exploring the whole phase space, right? And we are missing things, right? We can miss like extremes, like in the case I had here, missing the, the tails of the distribution. Or what you can do is you can be actually missing uh, some shift in the distribution, like climate change, for instance. So you don't know what to do with things when things are changing. And then the other part of that would be your, you have to rely much more on your knowledge where your basic data pool, so your sampling is not that great. And, uh, and you don't have so much trust uh, in, in that data sampling and you're not exploring the extremes. So in that case, you need to rely on your knowledge and your prior uh, you, you, uh, 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 as, a, as a way to improve things. So if you're interested in that right-hand side here, I refer you, there's a nice paper by Kumar's group looking at late temperature data, where you can actually regularize some machine learning algorithm based on some physical model and we have a relatively similar strategy in Yang et al. Uh, to, for streamflow data, where we do, don't have streamflow data across the globe, but we do have that in few places. So you need to rely still on a model as a way to constrain that. So. But for the rest of the talk, I'll focus more on uh, that hybrid type of approach in the middle, where we're trying to combine physics and machine learning. So the first issue we wanted to discuss, and that's also what Mike has presented before, is how can you actually uh, uh, kind of implement strict physical loads. And, and those could be energy and mass conservation. It could be some rotational invariance. It could be any type of invariance that you have. And the question is, how can you actually do it so that you have a strict requirement? And, and the trouble is that, again, if you use just a Lagrange multiplier, you will say, okay, I can penalize for anything that's actually deviating from that conservation law or that invariance. But the trouble at the end of the day is that it doesn't really strictly satisfy that. And so what you need is you need to have a strict physical load that's directly implemented there. And so what, one way to, to get around that, so that's some nice work by Tom Berkler, he's a, a, a research scientist uh, at UC Irvine in, in Colombia. And so the, the idea that, uh, that was found was to say, let's plug that directly into the a neural network architecture. And you can think of that Imagine that you have two constraints that you need to satisfy, like energy and mass conservation. And you could say, instead of solving for n degrees of freedom, which are all of the degrees of freedom of my neural network, I will leave basically two wiggle rooms, right, for those two degrees of freedom. And I will impose two additional constraints that will actually give me some additional constraint for the, for the, for the whole uh, uh, number of degrees of freedom. And so what you can have is basically in your architecture here, you can have what we call constraining layers. So additional layers that are not really where you can actually tweak that layer so that you can match exactly that strict uh, uh, conservation. So the easier, simpler way would be, imagine you have a linear uh, regression between different things that is giving you the energy constraint. So you leave one of the coefficient empty or, or, or varying, and you can make sure that you're actually at every time, so if you're matching for every iteration of your algorithm, you're matching that energy constraint. So that wiggle room that you have here is imposed at every, at every iteration. And that tends to work well, so you can get pretty much exact conservation within numerical errors. So that's on, on GPU, so that's why it's not as good as maybe on CPU. But basically that type of strategy works well to constrain energy or mass, or you could have some, any type of invariance. And it can be nonlinear, it looks linear here, but you can transform back a nonlinear system into a linear. And it just needs to be some combination of input and output that's giving you some constraint. So that's satisfying. Now the second issue that there we, we, we are facing is again that generalization issue. And here I'll focus on basically some work again by, by Tom where he's been looking at what is the generalization to a warmer climate of, of say convection here. And so this is just a, a large scale average of like the heating and moistening rate in the atmosphere that's actually 
predicted by the high resolution model. And basically the brute force version of the machine learning algorithm I showed you before is completely failing at actually producing that. So we have this very, very large divergence that has nothing to do with real life, you know? So it means that we are completely in the dark here. We are extrapolating. It has nothing, no constraint based on the, uh, on the training data that we had. So that's a major issue that, that we have. So how can you get around that? You could say, actually combining some physical knowledge, you know, as some sort of prior, you could say, maybe a way to get around that and improve things. So an easy fix would be to say, okay, let's say that we are, we are, as an input, we had specific humidity, which is a mass, you know, that's the amount of mass of water vapor you have in the air. We know with climate change that this is going to increase, but in fact, relative humidity, which is that percent change, you know, uh, of saturation water vapor. This we know is actually very well bounded, you know, and we kind of expect that not to be changing dramatically with climate change. I mean, there's been multiple studies showing that, you know, relative humidity is pretty much self-constrained and self-preserved. So you could use that as a trick and say, okay, instead of using specific humidity, I can add a little bit of physical intuition and can kind of help the neural network or whatever machine learning algorithm as a way to actually improve things. And when you do that this way, you can see that you have much, much better agreement compared to, to, to what we initially had. The second thing you could say is that, again, the trouble that you have is that temperature might be annoying as well, because temperature is going to be shifted, you know, uh, as you start looking at climate change. But the, what you could do is you could kind of normalize that and say, instead of using temperature, I can normalize that by the surface temperature. You can also normalize by that by the tropopause uh, uh, value. But basically, you can kind of rescale your temperature so that you're not, again, exploring things that you didn't have before. You want to avoid as much as possible that extrapolation. And, one way Tom is always checking now, which is nice, is to always to systematically check what is the new uh, uh, validation data uh, uh, distribution compared to the initial one. And I always think that's a very, very nice way to make sure that you're not extrapolating and you're doing things that are reasonable. And when you do that, I mean, things tend to improve better. And, and so now Tom also has some further improvement, also normalizing the, the, the output where for the output, so this was all for the input, but you can do the same trick for the output adding some physical knowledge so that you can normalize things. And one way I kind of like thinking about that is that if you've done some free dynamics, I mean, that's kind of doing some dimensionless analysis, right? We tend to like thinking in terms of Reynolds number or some, some dimensionless numbers, you know, and that's kind of a way to actually do that, right? When we do that for free dynamics, what we are implicitly doing is we are trying to get back to the original distribution, right? So that you can get some new observations, some new experiment, but you can relate that back to your uh, original knowledge. You know? So that's kind of a way we, we should be trying to be more systematic and trying to kind of do that dimensionless analysis more and more frequently when we are dealing with physical processes, again, to get back to, to, to things we know and things we've basically seen before. Oftentimes, I have to say, I mean, for, for this work, it, it sounds simple, but there are many ways and things that are annoying, like, uh, change in, in, in phase, you know, like you go from liquid and ice and that's not smooth or whatever. There are multiple issues, but at least having that thinking can, can help, you know, like that dimensional, dimensional analysis to some extent. I'll show you one final example where kind of imposing or adding physics actually helps. So that's again getting back to the, to the story of surface fluxes. And I showed you before that the extrapolation or generalization is a major issue for those algorithms. So what they basically do is, and that's what we are trying to replicate here, is they take some observations here. So those are pretty much weather station data, uh, except for F par here, which is some fraction of um, photosynthetically active radiation, some indicator of basically vegetation activity, you could think of the amount of vegetation we have. You pass that through a neural network and you're trying in that case to predict some of the fluxes. So here I'm just focusing on latent heat flux or evaporation basically at the line surface. And what you want is again, you want to predict that as a function of time and space and you use those in-situ data as a way to reproduce that. And that's, when you do that, I mean, actually this works quite well again. I mean, you're, you have very minimal slope issue, so no systematic bias and the R square is actually quite high, you know. But again, I showed you before that it doesn't really work when you're trying to generalize. So that's a major issue. The second issue, and we mentioned that before, is that you're not really closing the energy balance, right? So you have this issue of not really preserving energy. And that's a major issue when you 
again want to say look at climate change. So that's what when I started to be very disappointed with this type, type of strategy. And again, generalization is the issue. So one strategy we could use is you could say, okay, I have some understanding of the physics again, and I kind of know that evapotranspiration is based on a gradient, uh, and that gradient is the gradient of water vapor between the surface and the air, which is this ES minus E8 here. And that's gonna be modulated by some eddy diffusion, right, or some resistance here. So you can think in terms of electric circuit, right? So you have this potential difference between surface water vapor, the air water vapor, and then you're modulated by two resistors here. So one is the, the surface resistance dependent on vegetation, biology, and uh, 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 the, the biochemistry. And then you have the aerodynamic resistance, which is dominated by turbulence. And what you could do is you could say, maybe we have some understanding of the aerodynamic resistance. So let's try to target just that surface resistance instead of directly targeting the latent effects. Okay, so that's basically what we did. And in the meantime, you can say, I can use that and also impose the energy balance. So I have multiple constraints. So I have my energy constraint, and I also have some structural uh, uh, um, inference in my, in my model. So those are two things you can add. And then you're trying to target and trying to minimize, again, the misfit of uh, latent effects. When you do that, it works almost as well as the pure machine learning algorithm. So that's pure neural network that's trying to predict latent effects. Of course, you will not expect that to be doing a better job, right? Because by definition, you're, I mean, imposing things, right? So you would expect that to be to deviate to some extent. But the advantage is it does conserve the energy balance, right? So you have that advantage. So you could say you're already happy because you're conserving the energy balance and you're imposing that strictly. And you can use that as a way to understand what's actually regulating uh, evapotranspiration and what are the parameters and especially that surface resistance and what is that and how is that actually controlling that. And what we found is that the main predictors are actually soil moisture, which I think people kind of knew, but also vegetation height. And vegetation height we know is actually very important because it can regulate plant hydraulics and a lot of physical processes related to transpiration. Now, the more interesting thing I feel, and that's where, where we started getting excited about that, or at least I got excited about that hybrid type of approach, is that you can start looking at extremes, you know, and again, I mentioned before that this pure machine learning algorithm doesn't work so well, but you could say, what about those hybrid models? And what we found is that those hybrid strategies where you basically influx or you have some prior or inference from physics, you know, into your machine learning algorithm, systematically is beating the original machine learning algorithm. And so that's an example looking at the prediction of drought and heat waves and uh, some dryness in the air. And again, systematically, we're actually outperforming the pure machine learning, machine learning algorithm. And that's really for another sample generalization. So things we haven't seen in the original training data, we use the five to 95 percentile in the data uh, uh, of the, every single distribution, but we tested on the one and 99 percentile. And that's actually even worse when you start looking at the point one or point on 99.9 percent. .9%. So we're pretty happy with that. It means that you're not losing much of the you know, mean type of behavior, but you can really do a much better job in terms of capturing extreme. So it has potential to maybe detect some of those, which was the issue before, and maybe looking at, say, the internal variability in the carbon cycle. So quick conclusions here. So I didn't really go into like how we did those things, but if you're interested, just I hope you can read the papers, but and or reach out to me, uh, happy to discuss that. But I just wanted to show that machine learning can be useful as a tool for a prognostic physical process or biological processes, and especially for separate parameterizations. Um, and I, I showed you example of deep clouds, what we call moist convection and, and turbulence, but also for land surface processes like evapotranspiration. On the way, I hope I convinced you that we have some major issues like conservation, some physical invariance, some physical laws that we need to respect, and we just, just cannot go, get away with that. You know, we need to actually strictly respect that. And the second, what, what I find even more interesting is the generalization issue, and maybe that's also related to interpreting what those things are doing. You know, we want to actually do a good job you know, for extremes or climate change. And so one of the solutions I, I found pretty appealing is actually trying to combine in ways that are possible, like, you know, physical understanding of physical prior or, or, or some uh, inductive bias, you know, in terms of uh, uh, plugging that into your machine learning, uh, machine learning algorithm. And it seems to be a relatively powerful tool, at least in the examples I, I showed you before.
So with that, I'll thank you and thanks for the opportunity. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or we can discuss now and you can follow me on Twitter. You can just see some stuff. Thanks. Thank you very much, Pierre. That, that was a really insightful talk and lots of different topics on how we could combine physics and domain knowledge with machine learning. Uh, we also have quite a few questions on the Slido, so uh, maybe we can start uh, with some of these questions. Uh, so the first, first one up there is uh, physics simulators trained by model outputs are limited by some biases in the model. So is the ultimate bottleneck insufficient observational data sets for training? Yeah, I completely agree with that. And uh, actually a lot of my, what can I say, my, my issues with those algorithms came exactly from that, you know. So if you think about say cloud resolving models, you know, uh, they will still have a lot of issues, especially to, to predict climate change. So uh, with Mike and some collaborators like Veronica Irene, we are trying to look at those things and how can you actually go around that, you know? So I think that's the trouble. So how can you actually gain knowledge from those models, but at the same time, also looking at observations, you know, and I think you're right. I mean, we need to also look at observations. Are we missing observations? That's a good question. And I think there are techniques now that we need to use, you know, uh, uh, so I have a student actually working on that um, and, and trying to see how can we actually infer which observations and what variables and where uh, we need to actually acquire more, more of that. So those are really open, but really interesting questions. So thank you. There's one that's been bumped up. Uh, you pointed to several non-trivial machine learning issues. Do you think resolving these will be faster than just waiting for numerical resolution to catch up? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I don't really know. Um, I had lots of hope to, to actually use machine learning like really off, off the shelf, you know, but on the way we learned a lot of things and we found a lot of issues. At the same time, those are interesting questions anyways, you know, that could be used for some other application. So we are playing with that and we're having fun actually. Um, but though this is very good question, I don't know. Especially, yeah, with the hardware development as well. And yeah, very good question. I have no idea. All right, so the next one is, uh, could you share your experience on what were the disappointing factors of machine learning and AI in your areas of application? Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to allude to, you know, so that generalization issue is a major one. The lack of conservation uh, or, or physical invariance is, is another one. The fact that numerical models are not the, the, the holy grade, right? I mean, they look great. You know, you look at some cloud resolving models, I mean, they look amazing, right? But I mean, if you start looking more systematically, I mean, they have many, many biases as well. So how can you actually basically also learn from observations, which also have biases, right? So, I mean, it's not really just choose your poison, but how can you combine that? You know, those are important questions, I think. Yeah, I think that's really, really big question from Ben C. Yeah, so Ben, I guess sort of, yeah, related global high resolution models can still include large mean state errors, particularly in precip. Is yeah, we are learning those biases for sure, yes. yes. Yeah. And so that's a major issue. And that's also where I started looking and being very disappointed. And we had a lot of exchanges with Mike at the time. Yeah, when we were looking at climate change in particular, because yeah, your radiation balance is imbalanced. Yeah? So we have lots of issues. The next, next one's interesting as well. Are there issues with coarse grading the final resolution model as inputs due to the nonlinear processes involved? Uh, yeah, that's a tough one actually. Um, so the, 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 the very question is how do you define your coarse graining? And, and we've been banging our head you know, in, in terms of trying to define the coarse graining and the most uh, plausible one. And then you get into the same business as basically what people do in largely simulation in terms of what they call filtering, you know, what is the best filter that you use? And it's not just like a step function, you know, you could say, okay, maybe I want to preserve some spectrum or something. So yeah, that's a great question and it's tricky. Um, the advantage that we had in the cloud resolving model experiment I showed you was 
the cloud resolving model is actually embedded within some large scale models. So we have very clear scale separation, which makes things much easier. So that's, that played in our favor. For the DNS case, that was trickier. So we had the same issue of defining that average. So the next one from Ben is, do the deviations from energy balance tell you anything interesting? Energy balance is present in the observations. Why doesn't the neural network learn it? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I had the same thought at the time. Yeah, uh, I didn't really, or we didn't really have the time to look at it. But you're right. I think there's a lot of that we can learn from that. And we are trying to actually now understand, especially with Veronica Herring, trying to actually understand what those things are telling us. You know, about physics that we've missed, of physics that's incorrect. Yeah, so you're right. I think. Oh, this is a good one too. Can you comment on the uh, total, I guess, cost of training and data gathering? Mm -hmm. uh, this process is often very time consuming, so. Yeah, that's a great question as well. Uh, so for the training, actually in the end, it took uh, between one day and two days, you know, for the convective case. So that was not as much as you would think. And once it's trained, it's actually very cheap to run, right? Plus you can use GPUs that are typically, I mean, they typically go unused in climate or, or LES uh, uh, simulation. So that's a big advantage, you know, to take advantage of those uh, hardware, hardware uh, possibilities. Um, now, I think the main bottleneck that we have, and I think we need to have a lot more discussion on the infrastructure, you know, especially also to involve more the CS uh, and machine learning communities. How do we have a smooth way of actually get, getting the data? So the DNS data, so the the cloud resolving data I showed you is expensive, you know, but when you start looking at the DNS data, it's just awful, right? I mean, there's, it's very, very difficult to use, like many, many terabytes of data, and even getting snapshots is a, is a, is a nightmare. So what is the way we have, you know, to actually use that and most efficiently use those things? I mean, people have thought about online learning, you know, but then you have all of the business of the hyperparameter tuning, but I think what we need in the end is a platform that's really efficient, you know, and where the algorithm is closest to the data. So, for instance, my colleague Ryan Abanati has been working, really pioneering that stuff with a few colleagues, and uh, where really you're trying to work on the cloud and trying to be as close as possible to the, to the data. And I think we need to, as a community, we need to think way more about that. I mean, that's going to be a major, major roadblock. And it goes along with all of those ML developments. I mean, the type of data sets we're dealing with are much more like them cats and dogs. I mean, those are really big, you know, and even SMIP6 is really annoying to use, you know. So how do we get a, around that? I mean, those are very important questions. Maybe we'll take one or two more questions. Uh, there's one that's specific to one of your slides uh, from slide 10. Can you explain how you train the model for unseen conditions? Maybe you can just describe what that. Yeah, so what we did is we, I mean, we just trained on, on basically historical data, which was the, this prescribed sea surface temperature data. And then we evaluated that in a, in a warmer world. So we bumped the sea surface temperature and we checked what was the impact. And we saw that it was basically plain. So that's one set. So Kathy's question is an interesting one. Could you explain more on the reduction of the degrees of freedom when you apply physical constraints? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, indeed, I think a lot of what we are doing when we apply some physical constraint or we apply some structural knowledge is really that underlying uh, uh, reduction in degree, number of degrees of freedom. So for instance, for the example I showed you for evapotranspiration, we're really saying that, okay, in fact, the, the the, the existing manifold is actually much, much smaller than we originally thought, you know, so you're much more efficiently using the data you have. You know? Instead of trying to predict everything, you're trying to say, okay, evapotranspiration is behaving this way based on radiation and all that. You say, no, I actually know some things, right? And I know that radiation is going to be increasing my evapotranspiration, and the only thing that I'm, I'm going to regulate is stress, you know? And I think it does help a lot, you know, that, that dimensional reduction. Yeah, and you could, I agree with Clary, that's a form of regularization. So maybe we'll, we'll end with one final question that I've been sort of reframing in different forms for all the speakers. Uh, you you uh, mentioned this really clever idea that Tom and others have been working on, which is coming up with these non-dimensional numbers to 
sort of project back to the, the distributions that you've already learned. So uh, you're actually doing interpolation rather than extrapolation. Yes. So what do you suggest are uh, some ways in which we could do that for uh, different climate change types of uh, yeah. conditions? I, I think it depends on, uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I think the trouble of climate change is that you have many underlying processes, right? It's not about, about just temperature. I mean, you have changes in clouds and microphysics and things, you know. Um, and that becomes this type of strategy works well when you have, you know, this kind of canonical uh, type of idea like turbulent flows where you have just a few dimensionless numbers, you know. Um, it becomes much more difficult and that's where Tom has been kind of banging his head, you know, is that when you have many, many degrees of freedom, I mean, the, the, the dimensionless or dimensional numbers are much more intractable, you know, and that becomes much trickier. But the question still is, maybe you might not be able to directly find them, but can you actually still help, you know, and, and trying to shift back your distribution. But I think as a starting point, you know, even if you don't really know what they are, but at least investigating how the distributions are changing in a multivariate phase space in whatever application you're looking at and how different they are compared to the region ones is very, very insightful. And I would really suggest anyone to actually do that. I mean, that's the, the one thing to look at uh, because then you can really make sure whether, I mean, you can test whether or not you'll be doing things that are crazy because we have no idea what those are doing outside of the training day. Great, thank you so much, Peter. That, that was a really thanks. great talk and lots of nice questions too. Man, thanks uh, for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. And we'll take a short break again for uh, eight minutes and then start at 20 minutes past the hour with the next talk. Thank you. <laughs>